The next item of business is a statement by Hamza Yousaf on the conduct of reviews and inquiries. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement and so there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on Hamza Yousaf for 10 minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> Thank you, Presiding Officer. As a government and a society, we are all committed to ensuring the delivery of public services that treat all people uh, with kindness, with dignity and compassion that respect the rule of law and individual rights and that they act in the open and transparent way. When something goes wrong in the delivery of public services, then actions should be taken as close to the point of delivery as possible with the opportunity for errors to be acknowledged and action to be taken and lessons learnt promptly. However, in a small number of instances, the issues raised, whether due to the scale of the harm caused or indeed wider lessons to be learned, can only be addressed appropriately through the initiation of a statutory public inquiry or indeed a focused review. Such inquiries and reviews place significant demands on the individuals affected and the organisations involved and should not be considered or progressed without careful consideration and planning. As Cabinet Secretary for Justice, I therefore warmly welcome the work of Professor Alison Britton of Glasgow Caledonian University, who was commissioned by the then Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing to conduct a review into the process of establishing, managing and supporting independent inquiries and reviews in Scotland. Uh, both I and my fellow ministers wish to thank and pay tribute to Professor Britton and her team uh, for their efforts and for giving their time to produce a thorough, detailed and informative piece of work. Uh, it's a report that will assist in informing the decisions in the future about when to consider a formal inquiry or review and how they are commissioned and indeed conducted. The report makes a number of valuable recommendations and in particular is helpful in emphasising the importance of thinking very carefully in the critical early days when a review is a possibility to ensure that the right questions are being asked. What type of review or inquiry? How is the chair to be chosen? Is the remit being drawn with sufficient precision? Professor Britton was of course invited to undertake this review as a result of concerns expressed about the process of the independent review of transvaginal mesh implants that reported in March 2017. While Professor Britton has rightly highlighted, highlighted the missteps taken during that review, I think it's important to make three things clear. Firstly, and in no sense do I wish to minimise where the mesh review went wrong, I think it's only fair to point out that Professor Britton's conclusion was, and I quote, we were satisfied that no one involved in the mesh review was acting in bad faith. On contrary, public citizenship and sense of duty were the main factors in volunteering, volunteering to be part of the MESH review. Secondly, it is important to remember that Professor Britton's review did not re-examine the evidence looked at by the MESH review, nor reconsider its findings. Indeed, Professor Britton noted, and I quote again, we found no evidence to support the claim that evidence was deliberately concealed. The statistical evidence considered by the MESH review was published in an internationally recognised medical journal, The Lancet, in December 2016. And as such, the Chief Medical Officer accepted the MESH review's recommendations at the time of the publication of the final report. Thirdly, I think it's important to recognise that the majority of reviews and inquiries are conducted carefully, efficiently and in a manner which commands public confidence. I say this with two current public inquiries currently underway very much in mind. Firstly, the Scottish Child Abuse Inquiry and the inquiry looking into the Edinburgh Trans Project. I also wish to be abundantly clear that nothing within Professor Britton's report casts any doubt on the work of any other reviews or inquiries and a response to the report will not in any way delay or have an impact on the work of the statutory inquiries currently underway. Before commenting further on Professor Britton's review and mindful of the fact that it was prompted by what happened during the MESH review, I firstly want to say that I am deeply, deeply sorry that the suffering of those women affected by MESH has been <coughs> compounded by what went wrong with the process of the review. Members will be aware that in September, the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport announced a temporary pause to all transvaginal MESH procedures. This temporary halt will be lifted only when a restricted use protocol is developed and in place. It will be informed by new evidence-based guidelines from the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence and will ensure that in future, transvaginal mesh will only be used 
in the most limited of circumstances, subject to rigorous process. Both the Cabinet Secretary for Health and I hope that this action, which goes beyond that taken elsewhere, gives reassurance that this government treats this issue with the utmost importance and goes some way towards addressing the disappointment felt after the mesh review. Uh, I will not address all of Professor Britton's recommendations today, but I will touch on some. We are considering them carefully, all of them carefully, and I can guarantee that the experience of the mesh review will be used to inform all such future inquiries and reviews. The Scottish Government has developed guidance that will be available to all policy teams that are undertaking considerations of calls for a review or inquiry. The guidance covers the early consideration that I referred to a few moments ago. It also addresses the practicalities that come after the initial decision to hold a review. Does it need panel members to assist the chair? Where will suitable premises for the review be found? How will it be staffed? What IT support is required? Questions around transparency, accountability, impartiality. How will good governance be ensured for matters such as recording of decisions and the preservation of records for historical record? The guidance is near finalisation. I'm happy for it to be published on the Scottish Government's website in due course. It will also be publicised internally so that, a, so that a more consistent approach is taken across government to consideration of these issues. In addition, my officials who have drafted the guidance are available <clears throat> as a source of advice and support when there is a matter of public concern that has given rise for calls for a review or inquiry. I am clear, however, presiding officer, that while, while we wish to achieve consistency, there is no one-size-fits-all solution. Sometimes it is obvious that nothing less than a full public inquiry is required to restore public confidence and independently of government get to the bottom of what has gone wrong and how it can be avoided in the future. Public inquiries are not quick solutions. However, as I have said, they can place significant demands both on those affected and the organisations involved. Sometimes a well-focused review reporting swiftly, albeit unhurried, is a far preferable solution. Sometimes there are statutory bodies whose job is the independent scrutiny of a particular sector. Uh, for example, statutory inspectorates play a vital role in identifying both strengths and indeed areas for improvement within certain key public services. That is the job that they are there to perform. Similarly, a fatal accident inquiry conducted by a sheriff is the right mechanism to establish the facts and learn lessons following an accident or sudden death. Decisions about whether to progress a fatal accident inquiry, of course, rest with a Lord Advocate, uh, other than in those instances where such an inquiry is mandatory. The chair of an historic public inquiry identified the following elements of a successful inquiry. Interested parties would believe that a thorough inquiry into the issue, which had caused public concern, had been conducted with obvious fairness, and the final report was not overwritten or indeed under-researched that interested parties would feel that they had been given an opportunity to present their views, that the inquiry reaches conclusions that are justified by the evidence, and that the inquiry produces a report that people understand. I think that summarises quite well the critical objectives of any review or indeed any inquiry. The review undertaken by Professor Britton is of great assistance in ensuring that these objectives are achieved in every review and indeed every inquiry. I'm determined that future inquiries and reviews learn the necessary lessons and ensure that those who have suffered harm and the country at large are confident that a fearless, independent and robust investigation has taken place. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement and I'll allow around 20 minutes for that. Uh, would members who wish to ask a question please press the request to speak buttons now. And I call Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of his statement. The Britain report will be valuable, not least in ensuring the right questions are asked at the outset and to ensure the parameters are clear. It is good to hear that the recommendations will be considered carefully and that guidance has been delivered. However, I wish to focus on a particular point that the Cabinet Secretary made. He said rightly that sometimes it is obvious that nothing less than a full public inquiry is required to restore public confidence and independently of government get to the bottom of what has gone wrong 
and how it can be avoided in the future. He's unquestionably right, which is why I was surprised and dare I say troubled to receive his response to the joint letter from Willie Rennie, Daniel Johnson and I, in which we called for a public inquiry into the tragic death of Fred McClelland. The Cabinet Secretary stated he's not persuaded that a full public inquiry is the way forward and goes on to say an inquiry is first to determine the details of what happened and to make recommendations that can help prevent a similar incident. He's absolutely right and surely that is applicable to the McClelland case. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what would it take to persuade him that this is one of those cases where nothing less than a full public inquiry is required? to restore public confidence, what weight he accords to genuine cross-party calls for an inquiry, and will he not reconsider this decision to ensure all lessons are learned and these tragic events can never happen again? Hamza Youssef. Can I thank Liam Kerr for, for the question and the tone in, in which he asked uh, the question. Uh, there's nothing that I can do to take away from the grief that the McClellan family uh, have faced. I've met them on a number of occasions, three occasions, to listen to their concerns and to help assemble the information from, from relevant agencies and to gain a better understanding of the circumstances of, of Craig's death while also ensuring that wider lessons uh, are learned. And I think Liam McCare, uh, Liam McCare would, would accept that any decision to, to move forward a public inquiry or not is a very, very difficult one and one that has to be taken with extremely careful uh, consideration. What I would say to the members is that the Scottish Prison Service, Police Scotland, and indeed the Scottish Government, we accepted all 37 recommendations made by two independent inspectorate reviews that have already examined home detention curfew scheme, which included looking at the circumstances of James Wright release and the subsequent breach of HTC. As he rightly says, I've now written to the family of Craig McClellan, providing them further information and direct answers to the 34 questions that they asked of SPS, Police Scotland and indeed of the Scottish Government. To add an element of independent scrutiny, I've asked both inspectorates as part of reviewing how their recommendations are being implemented to consider that response and those responses uh, and whether they raise any further issues or concerns that may be needed to address. So I suppose in some respects I would ask the question in a slightly different way than, than Liam, or answer the question in a slightly different way than perhaps Liam Kerr would. And I would say, are we ensuring that lessons have been learned from what was a terrible tragedy? Uh, two independent inspectorate reports with 37 re recommendations, all of which will be accepted which will change to lead to a change in the HTC regime. Some of those changes, indeed Liam Kerr himself personally has called for uh, over, over a period uh, of time. And in the six months review that will take place, if the inspectorates come back to me and say that there is further change that needs to be made, that there are further questions that need to be answered, then at that point, I think, once the six month review has taken place, uh, I will then, of course, uh, be willing to have a further conversation on what more can be done. Neil Finlay. <laughs> Thanks, President Officer. Can I thank the Minister for the statement and Professor Britton for her very good report. I've been involved in forcing the government to undertake three major reviews of policy, two on policing and one on transvaginal mesh. The first resulted in the police investigating the police. The second will report next year. But it's the, me the mesh review that's caused me most angst. It was char characterised by systematic and repeated failures, all identified by Professor Britton in her report. Supposed to last a, one year, it lasted three chair resigned, three other panel members resigned. It was riddled with conflicts of interest. The chairs were chosen without any consideration into what skills were required. The review acted under, under directions from Scottish Government officials rather than autonomously. Subgroups were established, excluding some members of the review uh, and agendas directed by officials. And the final report excluded important information that, uh, the, uh, that was included in the draft report. These are just some of a catalogue of errors and problems. Uh, Professor Britton's report is very good and exposes very serious failures, and it proposes 46 recommendations for change. So will the government implement all of these recommendations? The government's had the report since June. It was published in October. So how many of those does the, gov does the minister accept today? Uh, is there uh, any intention? of revisiting, re revisiting the MESH review. Uh, after months, I think today's statement is pretty pathetic. Uh, we don't want uh, government written guidance. 
What we want is the full recommendations, all of them, of Professor Britton's report implemented. So will he bring this back to Parliament or are the guidance to be sneaked, sneaked out at some point? It's clear place, that the Cabinet please. Secretary wants to shelve these recommendations and he wants to shelve this report. But we will not let him do that. Hamza Yusuf. I don't think that's the intention at all, but let me, I think it would be churlish not to, to, to pay credit to the work that Neil Findlay has done, uh, and particularly in the plight of, of the women who have suffered in relation to transvaginal mesh. It would be churlish not to recognise that uh, and to put that on the record. But I, I do think he, he's incorrect, and let me try to explain uh, the reasons why. Uh, I did say very clearly that we would be publishing the guidance on the Scottish Government's website. I, I can make sure that uh, he gets a copy to that link uh, when it's published in terms. He asked me, uh, of course, directly in his question, will be accepting all of the recommendations? Uh, I would say the vast, vast majority of them, absolutely. Uh, I would say there are a couple, uh, at least, that I have an issue with, and I'd be happy to have a discussion with the member, or indeed, of course, the Parliament. But that will be very obvious in the guidelines. Uh, for example, there's recommendations in there around having a centralised unit within the Scottish Government uh, that, is, that is there for, for, for directing inquiries. Uh, actually, I think my own view still, and the government's view is, that it's still better done within portfolio. So it's the health portfolio that still takes the lead for, for example, the trans, trans, uh, transvaginal mesh. Uh, it would be uh, you know, the justice uh, uh, portfolio that would take forward uh, justice-related inquiries and so on and so forth. So there are some recommendations that I think from a logistical and governance point of view make sense uh, absolutely to accept the vast majority, the vast bulk of them. But there are a couple to a few that, that I have, uh, have um, uh, I'm still giving some, some further consideration to. And once that uh, guidance is published, and, and, and he will get a copy of the link to that guidance if he has further questions today, as only the opposition do, then, then of course I'll be open to, 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 to those uh, discussions. Uh, in terms of, of, of the review, uh, many of the recommendations, I, uh, I think the central recommendations to me make a lot of sense around uh, the impartiality of members, the, the, the uh, way we can be more transparent and around remit around terms of reference and so on and so forth. Uh, in terms of the transvaginal mesh review, again, that would be a, a question for, for the health secretary, but no, the, the government of course doesn't have, uh, isn't uh, going to, to rerun uh, the mesh review. The, the reasons for that I would say are uh, a few. Uh, one that uh, the, the, the process was looked at by Professor Britton, uh, there was no re-examination of the evidence and the findings are, as I understand it, uh, in line with findings from uh, England, from Australia, from the EU. Uh, but also, of course, the Health Secretary has put uh, an effective uh, temporary ban on, on using mesh and transvaginal uh, procedures uh, until a restricted protocol uh, is in place. And that is an important outcome, uh, which I think would be welcome uh, by those across the Chamber. Can I say to all members that the two opening questions have taken much more time than would normally be acceptable, but I allowed that because of the very important and uh, sensitive nature. So unless other members are quick with their questions and the minister is fairly uh, quick with his answers, I won't be able to get everyone in who wants. So first of all, Alison Johnson, followed by Willie Rennie. Thank you. Um, the Britain Review found that the MESH review was ill-conceived, thoughtlessly structured and poorly executed, and also raised concerns about the well-being of those taking part in the review, saying that some members left meetings crying and were traumatised by the publication of the final review. Now, I appreciate the Cabinet Secretary has said that he is determined that lessons are learned, but can the Cabinet Secretary advise what mechanisms will be put in place to prepare and to support people who can be taking part in what may be a very challenging process? Hamza, you said. Can I say to Alison Johnson that that will be part of, of the guidance and, and the guidelines there, but the point she raises is, is hugely important that... Um, the reason why we, 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 do, we have public inquiries in particular under, under the statute uh, that we have, but indeed also reviews, is that because these are issues of huge importance to people, often there will be issues that will be controversial, but often there will be issues that will have uh, huge emotional uh, impacts on people as well. So further consideration of the well-being structure we put in place is absolutely part of the guidance and part of uh, what, 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 what we're thinking. I, I do go back in terms of the mesh review that she specifically mentions, to the point I raised with, with Neil Finlay, not to labour the point at all, but um, in terms of the actual outcomes, uh, I believe the action the Health Secretary has taken will be welcomed uh, across uh, the Chamber, and they are the findings in line with other mesh reviews that have been conducted uh, across the world. But uh, the point that she raises, the central point that Alison Johnson makes around the well-being uh, of those taking part in reviews is absolutely critical uh, and one that is not lost in this government at all. 
Willie Rennie, followed by Rona Mackay. It's necessary to understand what has gone wrong before lessons can truly be learned. That has not happened in the Craig McIlland case. That's why we do need that public inquiry. Uh, the Minister refers to fatal accident inquiries in his statement. One of Professor Britton's recommendations is around speed of inquiries. We've still not had the fatal accident inquiry into the M9 crash, and the Clutha inquiry won't happen until next April. What influence will the Britain Review have on the speed of fatal accident inquiries in future? Hamza, you, sir. Just on the two points raised by, by Willie Rennie, I, I do disagree with him on, on, on the case in point around the Craig McClelland uh, case. Uh, there, there was two independent inspectorate reviews. There was 37 recommendations, and the government has not only accepted uh, all those recommendations alongside SPS and Police Scotland, but we have changed the HTC process, and we will look to see how we can further reform the HTC process. So I think it would be wrong to suggest that lessons uh, haven't been learnt. That, that where there are further questions, of course, opposition members and others can come to me directly with those questions or to SPS or Police Scotland. We will do our best uh, to answer them. And if they need independent scrutiny, there is a role perhaps from HMICS and HMIPS uh, to play in that. On the second point, I would say to him that he knows very well that FAIs are, are of course, under the, the, the remit uh, of the Lord Advocate. Uh, wasn't specifically the focus, uh, of course, of Professor Britton's review, which is inquiries uh, and reviews. Uh, we have, of course, uh, as a government, given money to, to, to uh, the, the Crown to help to speed up uh, fatal accident inquiries, but undoubtedly, undoubtedly, it has been raised by many members to me uh, across the chamber and uh, no doubt to Lord Advocate. So clearly there is a further discussion to have about how we can speed up uh, the many FAIs that are still outstanding, uh, while not directly a part of this uh, review. Uh, there continues to be conversations between myself and Lord Advocate uh, on this matter. Rona Mackay, followed by Miles Brigg. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The executive summary of the investigative rev review states, and I quote, we were satisfied that no one involved in the MESH review was acting in bad faith. How do we ensure that the best of intentions when conducting reviews results in the right outcomes? Hamza, you sir. Well, I hear Neil Finlay shouting, the implementing uh, the report. He's absolutely right. I mean, we will look to, to absolutely implement uh, the vast majority of recommendations. Mr. Finlay, it's him, someone else's question. I, I can hear him shouting uh, again around uh, you know, all of them. Uh, we have a genuine uh, concern around uh, a couple, or uh, as I say, maybe even a few of the recommendations, but the vast bulk of the majority of them we will absolutely accept. And if members wish to come back and ask the reasons uh, why we haven't accepted all of them, then of course I'm more than open to have that conversation. On Rona Mackay's question specifically, I think the answer uh, lies in the Britain report and within the guidance that we're developing uh, by following. Uh, steps about ensuring the right people are appointed, that they have the right support, by drawing up a remit carefully and appropriately, uh, by identifying conflicts and managing them at an early stage, uh, then we can ensure that reviews command public confidence. I reiterate that this is what happens in the overwhelming majority of cases, but clearly we want every single one of our inquiries and every single one of our reviews uh, to, to, to command public confidence. Miles Briggs, followed by Gil Patterson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It's clear from what we've heard today that the devil is going to be in the detail of these recommendations. And the Scottish Government, as we've heard, are currently working on guidance to be published. But it's important that we get this right so that the public can have confidence in the system. So can I ask two specific points with regards to impartiality and also recommendation um, being put in place to identify potential conflicts of interest? What work is the Government doing to take that forward? And will he share that with parties before the recommendations are published? Hamza, you sir. Uh, well, we've been obviously considering the report since its, uh, its publication, and, and the answers will be in the guidelines. I have to say, from having looked at the report in, in great detail, uh, b both the points around impartiality and conflict of interest uh, are ones I think well made in the report. Uh, I think we're giving serious consideration to, and ones that I absolutely think uh, will leave uh, us in a better way, in a better place when it comes to the conduct of inquiries uh, and reviews in the future. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very clear that those points around impartiality and potential for conflict of interest, which are related, of course, to public confidence, are ones that uh, will be explicit uh, within the guidelines that we produce. Uh, and of course, as I say, uh, thereafter, if the member wishes to have further conversations, he can. But I think there are two important points raised by Professor Britton, reiterated by Miles Briggs, and certainly the government uh, views them uh, as, as uh, helping us to make a better, more robust, more transparent, more accountable process of inquiries and reviews going forward. I have to say I'm not seeing answers and questions being any shorter or snappier than usual. 
Uh, Gil Patterson, followed by Neil Bibby. Thanks very much, President Officer. As the Cabinet Secretary knows, reviews uh, often involve personal tragedies. How can we ensure that reviews are always realistic in what they can achieve, so that those who have experienced life-changing events have clarity about what the reviews can indeed achieve? Hamza Yusuf. I think that is a really important point, uh, Presiding Officer, um, because we don't want to raise, uh, I suppose, unrealistic expectations, and it's incumbent upon all of us. Uh, and I think Professor Britton's report touches upon this. It's incumbent upon politicians, media, uh, and others to, to, to temper those uh, expectations, uh, of course, because they often will be around controversial issues, issues that carry a huge emotional impact uh, for individuals. Um, but we do also, and uh, we must be, of course, uh, uh, absolutely uh, robust when it comes to the transparency, when it comes to the independence, when it comes to the fearless nature of inquiries uh, and, and reviews. So um, that does not mean that, of course, all stakeholders will like the answers on the back of inquiries or reviews. Self-evidently, review cannot uh, heal a loss, uh, but where there has been a tragedy, it's right that, it's right that we seek to, to find out the truth uh, in, in that matter. So reviews and inquiries are not there, of course, we know to allocate either criminal or civil blame, or hold people to account. Um, uh, and uh, that is a point that does need to be, be perhaps made more clear uh, from the outset. Neil Bibby, followed by Fulton Gregor. The attempt by the Justice Secretary a week before Christmas to dismiss calls for a public inquiry into the failures that led to the murder of Craig McClelland is as shameful as it is insensitive. Two reviews have indicated 37 failures, but they have not answered Craig's family's most important questions about why these failures were allowed to happen. Why were these failures allowed to happen, Minister? Given you have been unable to answer that, and we do not know, why then do you continue to ignore the calls of Craig's family and a majority of parties in this chamber for a full inquiry? Hamza Yusuf. Can I say how disappointing it is that Neil Bibby has chosen to politicise it and, and characterise the issue uh, and, 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 and the death uh, in this particular way. I find, it, I find that actually shameful uh, more than anything. I find that really, really, not just shameful, but incredibly upsetting, actually. Uh, we've, I've met, of course, the, the family on, on, on three occasions. Uh, they then wrote to me with 34 questions. Uh, Those questions Mr. Bibby, would you please, uh, would you, you stop, please, Cabinet Secretary? Mr. Bibby, would you stop shouting from a sedentary position, please? Hamza Yusuf. The family then wrote to me and to SPS and Police Scotland with 34 questions. Uh, those responses to those questions have been given to the family. But as an additional level of independence, I've asked the inspectorates, both HMICS and HMIPS, to look over those responses. And if, within the six-month review that they're doing, those answers raise further issues that must be looked at, then the government will be absolutely open to looking at what those further issues may or may not be. These are difficult questions. Uh, to answer. Of course, they are difficult. Uh, and the decision that I have made bears no weight, no weight at all, no weight at all to the grief that the McClellan family has suffered. I don't take that away. And he can shout from a sedentary position uh, all he wants, but he should recognise that these are not easy decisions. Excuse me, um, Cabinet Secretary. Mr. Bibby, would you kindly stop being so rude and let the Cabinet Secretary finish his answer? And I, I finish on the point that Professor Britton's report suggests that politicians and media should be careful not to fuel unreal expectations when it comes to inquiries and reviews. And I would just say to Neil Bibby uh, that I think the politicisation of this issue is completely uh, wrong-headed. Fulton McGregor. Officer, the investigative review describes that media involvement, among other things, can often create pressure or emotional stress for members of a review. So following on from the last question, what lessons can be learned about how to manage this inevitable f um, feature of prominent reports in the future? Hamza Yusuf. Well, I think that a key learning point is that there uh, is consideration of whether the subject matter is likely to give rise to a strong media interest. And in most cases, when we do an inquiry or we do a review, there will be a, uh, an intense amount of media and indeed political scrutiny. It is, uh, if it is, then as Prof Professor Britton recommends, there should be support, advice, uh, perhaps even media training she suggests be, being made available to the chair and the panel members as required. But I also go back to Alison jo Johnson's point, important that uh, the appropriate support uh, and the well-being uh, structures are there uh, for those taking part. I can allow one more question, Gordon Lindhurst. 
the question of the, the length of inquiries has already been, I think, raised by Willie Rennie. Now, if we think of the Edinburgh Trams inquiry, um, the question I'd like to put to the Minister is this. Um, will consideration be given to setting uh, in advance of inquiries being conducted? The length of times those inquiries will take, how long will be allowed, and also the question of the, the budgets that will be spent on these inquiries. Hamza Youssef. Uh, can I just make the point, uh, important point of clarification to Gordon Lynnhurst? Uh, the, the Willie Rennie was asking about fatal accident inquiries, and it's really important that we don't conflate fatal accident inquiries with inquiries and, 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 and reviews. In terms of the Edinburgh Trams uh, inquiry as an example, I, I won't go into that specific, but it's really important that this inquiry, of course, looks to, 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 to uh, detail as much transparency, accountability around inquiries and reviews. I think if a government minister was to limit the budget and the time of an inquiry, the question would be, is it being done then in a rushed manner? Uh, is it being limited in terms of its scope? Is the government interfering in a way that is unnecessary? Uh, the tram inquiry would be an, an, an example of where there was literally, I think as you know, was literally millions of documents, six million if I remember correctly, but literally millions of documents. Uh, if I had limited, or if a previous uh, uh, minister, cabinet secretary that had made that decision had limited the amount of time or indeed the budget for the trams uh, inquiry, then they might not have been able to examine and explore those six million uh, documents in the detail that they have to be. So I would be concerned, I understand this point and I understand where it comes from and from a, from a good place I think around trying to get to the, the answers and to the truth as quickly as, as we can, uh, but I would have concerns about limitations uh, because I think that could be uh, limiting uh, and, and rushing, I should say, an inquiry uh, or a review. That concludes the ministerial statement on the conduct of reviews and inquiries and I'm sorry that Stuart Stevenson, Daniel Johnson and Tom Arthur weren't able to be called but perhaps all members could consider uh, the time they take to ask questions and answers.